Welcome back to some more health accumulation. So we're talking about melatonin versus Benadryl. So melatonin, you know, it's responsible for signaling our bodies that it's time for sleep. Like let's get ready for bed, let's rejuvenate, let's refresh. In itself, it does not actually induce sleep, though many people take it for sleep, right? Uh, Benadryl, on the other hand, blocks the effects of histamine and acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the main chemical, I believe I talked about this last time, in our brain that transmits information from one nerve cell to the next. If transmission between one nerve cell to the next is not happening good, it's not happening efficiently, it's not well, we are not well, our mind is not well. So melatonin does not have a lethal dose. This doesn't mean that the more melatonin, the merrier, or you're going to get greater benefit, or you just like keep pumping. If it doesn't seem like it's working right now, I'm just going to take more. That doesn't mean that that's going to help either, but it, it's not lethal. It's not going to kill you. Uh, and Benadryl, it can kill you, actually. At 1,000 milligrams, Benadryl can, can kill a human being. But they did uh, studies on animals, and they gave them 54,000 milligrams of melatonin. And guess what? Animals are fine. And there's been no, basically, toxicity, lethal doses noted in any humans. Um, so, yeah. One to five milligrams is usually what most humans are taking for sleep. Um, there are tablets now that have, you know, uh, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 60 milligrams. But it's going to be a challenge. And if you want to hurt yourself with melatonin, it's probably going to happen. Unless you're one of those people, like, it's like the nightmares and the, the crazy dreams when you're sleeping. Um, that, that can be really uncomfortable. And most who get that sensation just decide I'm not gonna take melatonin again, which I think is a great idea. So yes, it'd be challenging to also to kill yourself with um, or hurt yourself greatly with a, an acute dose of a Benadryl because um, hitting a thousand milligrams is gonna be challenging. But uh, we're gonna go over you know some of the uh, things that really do separate why you may not want to use Benadryl and why you probably potentially could benefit from melatonin. So. When it comes to natural sleep aids versus say something like Benadryl and artificial sleep aid, uh, it's paramount that we consider, you know, what are the long-term consequences of consistent use, consistent dosing of the substance? And kind of across the board, if we're thinking natural versus synthetic artificial, we gotta think what is the long-term consequences? If maybe it is helping me out right now, maybe, you know, I need it for this moment, but what happens if I take that again for the next moment, for the next moment, you know, what is that doing to me? So in comparing Benadryl to melatonin, you know, they really do move our bodies in very opposite directions when it comes to long-term use. And um, Benadryl is associated with a reduced cognitive function and uh, that thing called dementia, which nobody wants to come anywhere near um, that D word. Whereas melatonin, uh, actually when melatonin is deficient, it promotes cognitive decline. And uh, when we supplement with men melatonin, it's actually shown to decrease delirium, which is a precursor to that same D word, dementia. So like I said, we're going in very opposite direction. One seems to have some benefit. The other one has um, strong implications of decreased benefit, in fact, promoting that disease condition. Uh, melatonin has also been studied in treatments for Alzheimer's disease and in being protective uh, against aluminum toxicity because aluminum uh, can actually cause neurodegeneration of uh, or, or it's associated with a lot of neurodegenerative diseases and aluminum is highly toxic it's, it's highly oxidative and destructive to nerve tissue so melatonin potentially could be um, kind of an antidote um, or help a person who has been exposed to aluminum or who's having neurodegenerative symptoms related to aluminum toxicity something to consider uh, because there's not a whole lot of things that um, act as antidotes or support or help somebody who's uh, going through uh, aluminum toxicity. <clears throat> if you've been on this channel at all, I hope you've got the idea that muscle, building muscle, maintaining muscle mass is of paramount, vital uh, importance when you talk about, you know, leading a full, robust, vital life longevity that allows us to do stuff and not just be alive, um, you know, not dead. So the nervous system and the effects of Benadryl versus melatonin, you know, really they're, like I said, they're the opposite. Same thing goes for the muscle system and our musculoskeletal 
uh, uh, management. Melatonin goes in one direction, Benadryl goes in another. Hope you're getting, getting how this works. So melatonin, on one hand, has data suggesting that it actually is beneficial for preventing sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is that thing where uh, we get muscle wasting, uh, our, our muscles and, and our strength weakens over time, we, mitochondrial density within the muscle goes down, and really it is a hallmark, sarcopenia is, a hallmark of aging and um, just like how much we're aging. So this process of deterioration unfortunately does start to kick up uh, around age 40. And uh, I'm 41 right now, so poof, I gotta get after it, right? I gotta stay after it to make sure I maintain as much muscle mass as possible so that I have a, a, a long, um, capable life and not just be around, but be capable. I think that's the best thing. I don't wanna be pushed around a wheelchair. I don't wanna be, um, you know, under having to be under somebody else's care. So this is another reason for each of us to consider our sleep habits, our use of lights at night, our tablet use, our smartphone use. You know, we've got a bunch of blue light blaring at us every night. Are we leaving, you know, our, our lights on our house everywhere and just like light, light number house at night when it's eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night? Uh, because light is what basically contributes to decreased melatonin levels, whereas darkness promotes melatonin production. And, you know, this act activity is crucial for us to take advantage of every single night, you know, 365 days a year, hundreds of days, thousands of days, um, over our lifetime, where we're um, consistently getting this full kick of melatonin for the night, as opposed to, you know, all the blue light spectrum hitting us, you know, from 6 a.m. when we wake up till 10 o'clock when we go to bed at night. And, you know, now we're, we're, we're deficient in melatonin night after night after night after night. And that's not even talking about, you know, after 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, when mel melatonin just generally is lower um, across the aging population. I think maybe that is why God, when he created the heavens and the earth, he said, light for the day and darkness for the night. God always knows what's best, so we want to stick with his plan as much as possible. If we don't, you know, it's just, it's not going to work out as well for us. So as well as supporting muscle maintenance, um, melatonin is also shown in animals and cell cultures to, to promote mineralization of bones and to improve bone mass. So when we mineralize bones, we're essentially increasing their density. And that's what you want. Because old people don't have very good mineralization, young people do. And recent studies have shown that melatonin, when it's added to osteoporosis medications, say like Fosamax, that it actually has a, a significant impact on savings and healthcare costs due to the fact that people are not hurting themselves, they're not fracturing bones, they're not, they're not having, um, you know, osteoporosis, then having the pains related to degeneration of a bone structure. And, uh, you know, when you decrease bone degeneration, you decrease the complications of bone disease and the country saves money, you save money. And better than that, you just enjoy life more. So on the other side of things, we have Benadryl and it has quite the opposite effect. Like I mentioned earlier, especially on muscle tissue in Benadryl's an antihistamine, correct? It, and when you give an antihistamine, such as Benadryl, uh, around a workout, it actually blocks the flow of blood to the tissues that were worked out and, 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 and blunts the beneficial inflammatory response created by an exercise muscle. So if we don't have any inflammation, if we don't have um, enough blood flow to muscles that we're working out, the repair mechanisms will not happen. And we, will, we have to have like that pain you experience after workout that burning sensation, all that, that's, that's a necessary, that lactic build that is necessary for growth and repair of muscle tissue adaptation to occur. So that the next time you do a workout, it'll be that much easier. And, and you'll be able to um, notice that you're actually gaining fitness ground over time. So this, when the process of repair and blood flow are blunted, such as with Benadryl, then muscle damage and something called domes or delayed onset muscle soreness, it's actually increased. Does that stink? Uh, so this then leads to, you know, slower muscle adaptation and essentially more work on our part with less benefit. So I take a Benadryl and I work out and I'm actually going to gain less from this workout. I'm going to take me longer to recover because of this, this constriction of blood flow to these muscle tissues and the blunting of the beneficial uh, inflammatory response. 
So not all, all inflammation is bad. We need some inflammation to generate uh, a renewal of our body. So both melatonin and Benadryl, you know, they're available over the counter and they have minimal direct financial costs, right? Both of them are super cheap um, to buy. But like I mentioned, when you're putting them in your mouth, especially consist consistently, the long-term implications um, of grabbing one versus the other, they are significant. In fact, they are polar opposites. So this is something we all want to consider when we choose the type of pill or tablet um, we're going to use to support our, you know, our current symptom situation. In this case, we're talking about sleep and sleep onset and maintaining sleep, uh, which both have the potential of helping with, but one in melatonin, you know, has all these benefits long-term. The other in Benadryl, it, you know, it's kind of a poison. I mean, I shouldn't say kind of, it is a poison to our body in the long-term. So the question you ask before you grab this pill or that pill is, what is the long-term effect of this decision on my life? And, uh, you know, am I going to do that again? Just one, once in, one and done kind of forever, one and done for a year, or just like a couple times a month, a couple times a week. Uh, it really starts adding up over a lifetime. All right, I'm Dr. Matt. Hope this is helpful. If you have any questions about Benadryl, melatonin, if um, you've been taking either one and having this effect or that effect, if you've had those crazy dreams with melatonin, uh, man, I'd love to hear about it. All right. Talk to you guys later.